Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Scott Slovic from the University of Idaho, and it's been a great pleasure to have all of you here in Moscow, Idaho this past week. I've had a wonderful time attending panels and plenaries, visiting the exhibits, and catching up with many of you while walking between buildings on campus, over meals, during today's walk on Old Pullman Road, and at last night's venues for the progressive evening. And I, I do hope that you enjoyed yesterday's experiment with the progressive evening, wandering around Moscow, the kind of thing that we couldn't necessarily do in just any location, but um, there are some special qualities to Moscow, Idaho that enabled us to do that. I also hope that those of you who went on field trips today enjoyed yourselves and managed to stay cool enough. I see people trickling in now, and I'm just hopeful that we didn't leave any people stranded, uh, <laughs> languishing by any roadsides. Uh, that almost happened on our walk here in town, where, which was much hotter than we expected. But I, I do, do hope you had a good afternoon. So this evening, it's my great pleasure to join my friend Donna Potts from Washington State University in, in nearby Pullman in moderating this gathering of Palouse writers. As we watched the plans for this week's conference take shape a year ago, it occurred to us that in addition to featuring prominent colleagues from throughout the West and even further afield among our plenary speakers, it might be exciting for conference participants to encounter some of the distinguished literary voices from precisely this part of the world. Moscow actually calls itself heart of the arts and is a locale brimming with artistically inclined people of all types, from writers to musicians. We actually contemplated the idea of holding events for this conference in both Moscow and Pullman, but decided that the logistics of traveling the eight miles or so between the U of I and WSU were just a little bit too complicated. But tonight's panel is, in essence, a sample of local literary lions and especially those with strong inclinations to write about place and about other aspects of the natural world. The Palouse, of course, is larger than Moscow Pullman. If you look up the term Palouse, and I encourage you to do so, if only to see the spectacular aerial photographs of this region, uh, this, uh, which encompasses roughly the rolling agricultural hills north of Lewiston-Clarkston, which is due south of here, and the Tri-Cities in southern Washington State, all the way up to Spokane in the north. If you look that up, you'll see that this area is characterized by eye-catching dune-shaped hills frequently seeded with varieties of wheat, lentils, garbanzo beans, and peas. And by the way, I hope you enjoyed receiving the sample packets of lentils in your registration packets courtesy of the local pea and lentil commission. Not every town has a pea and lentil commission. The goal, so the goal of tonight's session is to acknowledge the fact that this is a fertile region for the literary imagination as well as for pulses. Pulses is another term for edible seeds in the legume family. Um, so you can take that bit of information away uh, from you. And I, I was joking at one point as we were planning the conference that I hope this would be a conference with a pulse, with a certain kind of energy, um, and I met more than lentils. Um, this week we've been experiencing and celebrating environmental voices and ideas from throughout the world. This evening we're pleased to share with you some of the finest local voices. Our plan is for me to introduce the first four of our eight writers, each of whom will read for eight minutes. Donna will then introduce the next four writers and will follow up with a few closing remarks. And I hope we'll have a bit of time remaining so that we can open things up for a brief Q&A. I will remind our readers when their time is up with this little cowbell, um, which is a, something I learned at, while attending a conference in Australia. It just seems appropriate to ring a cowbell for my colleagues. Um, I believe, too, that books by our panelists will be available for sale and signing following this, the session. In fact, I think Book People has a table right out here. So thanks to Book People for that. So our first reader of the evening is the extraordinary memoirist and novelist Kim Barnes. We're moving in alphabetical order by last name. 
Kim Barnes, who lives on Moscow Mountain with her husband, Bob Wrigley, our final reader of the evening. I've learned a lot about Idaho from reading Kim's works, um, uh, such as her memoir, Into the Wilderness, Coming of Age in an un in Unknown Country. Kim teaches in the MFA program in creative writing at the University of Idaho and is taking a break. She said just a minute ago that she's hardly been sleeping. She's so busy with her writing group this week. They have a special congregation this time of year. So she's been meeting with her writing group. She's finishing her latest novel and she's taking a brief break from fishing the nearby rivers of Idaho in order to be with us tonight. Kim Barnes. No cowbell, no cowbell. Okay, thank you, Scott. Thank you all for joining us here on the Palouse tonight. It's an honor to be in such creative and caring company. I'm going to read a few short sections from my essay titled Almost Paradise. And it's about, in 2000, Bob and I moved our family from Lenore, Idaho, which is between Lewiston and Orfino on Highway 12. Our house there looked directly over the Clearwater River, and we made the move to Moscow. And I realized at some point that it was the first time I had ever lived away from water because my father was a logger and I was raised on the feeding streams and on the North Fork, uh, the feeding streams of the North Fork and the North Fork of the Clearwater River. So I also want to acknowledge that uh, this essay was included in an anthology edited by Mary Clearman Blue and Phil Drucker. And uh, I want to dedicate this short reading to Phil, who would have loved being here for this conference and whom we all miss so very much. Fifteen years, that's how long it's been since I left the river. I don't say since I moved to here from there or since I began living on the mountain. I say left the river as though I were saying left the church or left my husband or left the country of my birth. I left late autumn mornings with the windows open when I woke to the cool mineral smell of silt. Afternoon picnics along the sandy shores, my children sifting the shallows for tadpoles, water skippers, mussel shells. Evenings fly fishing the V of current for rainbow, then watching the moon rise over Angel Ridge, its silvery wedge of light illuminating the bridge below our house so that the rib structure itself seemed to levitate above the water. In this new place, looking out over the dry land farms, marginal wells and seeps that sometimes feed the smallest of ponds, I realized what I was feeling was a kind of grief. Get a, give it a year, a friend said. Moving is hard, but I was happy to be in our new home, our new town. I know, I told them, I know how lucky I am to be in this idyllic place. Why then did my heart feel as though it were breaking? When my husband asked, what do you need to feel better? I knew the answer without hesitation. Water, I want, I need, I desire, water. In his memoir, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, psychologist and philosopher Carl Jung tells of one of his first memories a childhood visit to Lake Constance. He remembers how his mother could not drag him away from the water. The waves from the steamer washed up to the shore, he writes. The sun glistened on the water and the sand under the water had been curled into little ridges by the waves. The lake stretched away and away into the distance. This expanse of water was an inconceivable pleasure to me, an incomparable splendor. At that time, the idea became fixed in my mind that I must live near a lake. Without water, I thought, nobody could live at all. Jung's words are literal and absolute. No living thing can survive without water, but his words are also figurative. For me, the river is more than water and canyon. It is my history, my past, 
my inheritance. It is the story of my parents' quest for the perfect home and the logging camps of the Clearwater, my coming to awareness of myself along the banks of Reeds Creek, the way my life is divided by the building of Dwarshack Dam, how the death of the Upper North Fork mirrored the demise of my child's sense of happiness, contentment, and shelter. That first fishing season after our move from the Clearwater to Moscow, we loaded our daughter and son fishing gear into the car and headed north for the upper reaches of a river not to be named, only a watershed away from a childhood home on the North Fork. The closer we got, the more vibrant I felt, as though I were passing backward through time, regaining lost years. I rolled down the window, breathed in, hung out my head like a dog, my eyes closed against the sting of wind. I didn't wait to help unload, and no one asked me to. I nosed straight for the water and waded in. It was like eating pie after a long fast. I was faint with happiness, adrenalized with a sugary pleasure that I could not get enough of. I stood in the river for hours, casting my line, reminding myself to look, to feel, because I knew that soon it would be gone from me. And two days later, when it was time to go, after we had taken down the tent and stowed the coolers and everyone was belted in, I stalled. Just one more minute, I said. I'll be right back. I ran to the river, bent down and filled my hands, rinsed my face, the back of my neck, my shoulders. I knelt on the hard rocks and began to cry and could not stop, not even with the cold water against my eyes and my husband coming to check on me. Not just tears, but gulping sobs. I felt as though I might die, as though some part of me might not survive if I left that water again. You see, it's not simply the place that I miss, but the recognizable stories it contains. I miss the river because we took our children there to learn to fish and to find the shells called angel wings and to swim carefully at the edges of eddies because it was there that our daughter buried her precious stuffed bunny in the sand where she believed he'd be safe and warm and no one knew until it was too late, until the water had risen and carried him away. Because her little brother wanted to go back and find it for her, even in the fearsome dark. Because that is where our black lab violet, now dead, swam out to fetch sticks and return them to us again and again until dusk made it impossible for us to see her and we feared she'd been swept away. How can we separate ourselves from the land that holds our stories? As mobile and transient as we are, how do we maintain a stable identity and not lose some sense of our place in the world? What do we miss when we can no longer say, there, my mother made us a pallet beneath the stars. There, my father lifted me into the branches of the elderberry. There, we buried my grandmother. There, where my son and daughter built cities in the sand, I myself once played, and the water that washes their feet once washed mine. Even now, the river's echoing thrum follows me into sleep. Often my dreams are made of nothing more or less than the simple and singular event of standing in moving water. What I know is this. I am on a journey, being carried along by the swiftly moving waters of my own life. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Our second reader is Mary Clearman Blue, who also works in the genres of the novel, memoir, and the essay. Mary, who received the Western Literature Association's Lifetime Achievement Award, has just this month retired from the English department at the University of Idaho after 21 years. She recorded her memories of growing up on a small cattle ranch in Montana in All But the Waltz, Essays on a Montana Family, and various other works of nonfiction. 
This evening she'll read from a new novel in progress. Mary Clearman Blue. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Scott. Uh, the uh, narrative voice in this novel, this is an excerpt from about halfway through the novel, and the narrative voice is a woman who's looking back at her 16-year-old self with uh, some surprise and incredulity and maybe dread at the turns her life took then and afterward. Um, she's, uh, as, the, uh, as this scene begins, she's uh, bussing, di she's 16 years old, and she's bussing dishes uh, probably illegally at a restaurant slash bar called The Alibi, which uh, is in a town not unlike Lewiston, Idaho. <laughs> Tonight, for once, The Alibi features live music in the lounge. For all the live music, it's a slow night in the restaurant. So in between carrying trays of dirty dishes to the kitchen, I can hang out in the archway between the restaurant and lounge and listen. Not that I'm into their music. I'm a smart-ass 16-year-old, and I know everything worth knowing. And this summer, I've been listening to Nirvana and Eminem. From these guys' clothes and their long hair, I hope they'd be into rock, but no, they're playing covers of country songs, mostly popular tunes like Unbroken, George Strait and that, crap I hear blaring from other people's car radios, but occasionally something older and better. They're pretty good. The lead guitarist is damn good, in fact. At some point in the, unyet, in the yet unforeseeable future, I'll learn that he's had classical training but turned his back on it to start his own garage band in Boise. Now the band's got their name on a poster in front of the ba bandstand, The Rivermen. I can tell they love some of the older crossover classics when the lead guitarist, also the vocalist, sings Hickory Wind in a sweet, wistful tenor. He's wearing blue jeans and a dark blue satin shirt, and he's got ta tawny hair down to his shoulders and a jawline that my fingers want to trace. I'll hear hickory wind in my head for a long time after tonight. I'm too young to wait tables or serve cocktails, and there's an invisible line between the restaurant and the lounge that I'm forbidden to cross. Dave, the bartender, doesn't have much to do on this slow night either, and he's keeping an eye on me. He knows I'm underage and that Brad Forsman will give him help. I'm late getting home. Brad's already unhappy with me. Brad hates that I've quit school, hates that I'm bus bussing dishes in the alibi two nights a week, and he holds as strict a line on, him, on me as he can. Still, Dave may not even realize how young I really am. Even at 16, I'm a big, tall girl. When their set finishes, the guys in the band head for the men's room. The lead guitarist, not seeing me hovering in the archway, brushes my shoulder and looks down to see who he's bumped into. Hey, darling, he says. He's a head taller than I am and so lean and rangy that the blue satin shirt hangs from his shoulders. He smiles and I melt and he puts an arm around me and leads me to the booth where the other guys have started on their beers and are talking about breaking down their gear and loading it in the van. Dave looks up sharply and comes around the bar wiping his mustache. He's had one or two himself on this slow night. Ruby, you're out of line. You know you're not supposed to be in here. Hey, she's fine. Dave looks around at his last paying customers and then at the guys from the band who have paychecks to spend. Just so she don't order nothing, he said. The boys tell me their names. Brazos, the rhythm guitarist, Bill, the drummer, and Gall. Gall, the lead guitarist. I tell them that I'm Ruby. Gall keeps his arm around me, and I feel heaven and the warmth through the blue satin shirt. Another round of beers, and then Bill pushes himself up out of the booth and starts striking the set on the bandstand, unplugging speakers and winding up electrical cords. Gall and Brazos watch him work and talk about learning to read music. For some reason, Brazos is trying to learn, but he's finding it hard after years of picking everything up by ear. Lazy, says Gall. Oh, hell, easy for you to talk. You learned what when you're about six? I can read music. They both seem to remember that I'm there. Do you know how to play, says Bra Brazos? Yes. Oh, I bet you don't. An old piano stands closed and battered at the back of the bandstand. I've never seen anyone touch it, but I slide out of the booth and run to the bandstand and lift the lid of the piano. 
Even Bill stops to watch as I dash into Tarantella. Holy Christ, I guess you can. The van rumbles around the sharp curves of Highway 12, straining on the rising grades and making up for it on the straight stretches. Brazos is driving. Later, I'll learn he always drives. Bill has pulled an acoustic guitar from behind the second seat. He plays, and they all sing along with a song I've never heard about a girl who ran away from her husband to become a folk musician. His big mistake was buying her that Ford Econoline. Although we're in an old Volkswagen van where I nestle with gall on the sleeping bags and breathe in his sweet skin, and he kisses me along my hairline. I'm warm and contented and feeling drowsy, and I drift in and out of sleep until all of a sudden the brakes screech and we've come to a halt. Not Brad. Don't let it be Brad is my first thought. Holy Christ, would you look at that? And now we're all awake and sitting up and staring out the windshield at the giant in the headlights. Its head with its heavy brandishing crown of antlers turns to stare at us. With eyes as fiery as though sending us a flaming message from the world of the wild, my blessing on your way. Or so I perceive in the moment. Later, Brazos will explain that the bull elk couldn't possibly have seen us. Couldn't have seen anything but the blinding headlights. But now, in the now, Brazos cuts the headlights and the bull makes its stately way across the highway, followed by another and another and another huge, tawny beast in no hurry. Brazos finds his voice. That was the Selway elk herd. Glad I saw that, Bill Breeze. What a sight. I'm glad the brakes were good. We drive on toward Missoula. In the hum from the heater and the scent of male bodies and the comfort of close and sheltering arms, I feel blessed and safe as though nothing bad can happen to me as long as Gall holds me and Brazos drives and Bill plays the guitar and sings softly about rain and snow and loss and love. What did I imagine? That the Selway elk herd could save me? I thought now it was like believing in song lyrics, which I guessed I did once upon a time. Thank you, Mary. Uh, when I first met Peter Chilson, who teaches nonfiction writing at Washington State University and has been a recipient of the AWP Award for nonfiction, I thought I heard him say that he was doing research for a book about Maui, as in Hawaii. And I remember thinking, wow, what a nice job that must be. <laughs> Peter, it turns out, is an expert on West Africa, has lived in Niger as a Peace Corps volunteer, and is a longtime visitor to Mali, not Maui, where his current research is based. Tonight, he will read from a short story called American Food, which links his experience with Africa to his life on the Palouse. Peter Chilson. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's true, I'm, uh, right now I'm writing a book about the war in Mali, but uh, tonight I'm going to read uh, from a story that uh, came out of some experiences I had shadowing an African biologist, a uh, soils biologist in Mali about 10 years ago. This biologist also happened to be a friend of mine who worked uh, on the faculty at Washington State University. Um, he, uh, he told me a lot of stories about his life on the Palouse, including the fact that he was very concerned about his two young children losing their, uh, their, their cultural roots in Africa. So he, he also told me a story about a, a meal that he planned, uh, a traditional African meal uh, um, that had a, a, a goat head, actually. And uh, it didn't go well. Um, and out of that, he, uh, he, he he, he told me a, uh, quite a bit of that story, and I made up a, a bit of fiction um, from that story. Um, and this is the uh, story American Food, and this is how it starts. <coughs> Professor Keita Traore is, according to the best authorities on West African ecology, the man 
on the soils of the Sahel region. He knows what should and shouldn't be grown there. He can talk dirt across six countries, which gives him certain marketability in a land wasting away under heat, wind, and too little water. Governments pay him to study the land where he grew up, herding goats and planting yams with his family. He has advanced degrees in botany and geology from France and the United States. He can pick up an infrared satellite photograph of, say, the Madhyama district in Mali and tell you what the soil depths are at a given longitude and latitude, what plants grow there, and how much carbon can be found at a depth of six centimeters. And he can do it fluently in four languages. But Keita Traore cannot cook goat head, his favorite food. So, he, he planned to cook this delicacy for his family to, to give his, uh, his young children who'd been born in Africa but grew up on the Palouse the experience of, an African, of African food and, and to make his, his wife, uh, and, and to give his wife some, some taste of the food that they had grown up with. But as I said, things didn't go well. Uh, there were all manner of cultural misunderstandings. There, the police got involved, the neighbors. There was a, a, a goat head boiling in a pot in the bushes outside the apartment complex. So uh, later in the story, what I'm going to read now is the scene where he, uh, he, 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 he attempts to purchase the goat from a local farmer on the Palouse. Keita quickly chose the fattest goat, one with a coat of white fur, except for its head, which was brown and, brown and white. They settled the price, then disagreed politely about how to properly slaughter the animal. Cheryl offered to do it herself, but Keita wanted it done in accordance with Muslim ritual, the cutting of the animal's throat with the wound facing east, the direction of the holy city of Mecca where the prophet Muhammad was born. This way, the blood would spill on the earth, cleansing it and honoring Muhammad's very memory and work in the name of Islam. Muslim hands alone must handle the animal, Keita explained. As they talked, Keita stood a few feet from Cheryl, his hands folded behind his back in a posture of calm insistence. Cheryl smiled at him, intrigued and unsure whether or not she should be annoyed. She said, don't you trust me? Then she smiled a little flirtatiously. Cheryl Banks had known Keita Traore for seven years, since he was a graduate student in her animal anatomy class, one of the sharpest students she'd ever worked with. He was quiet and efficient, detail-oriented, and comfortable with animals, a good scientist. But she realized that morning that she really didn't know him at all. She said a little playfully, Keita, be honest. You won't let me touch the animal because I'm a woman, is that it? Keita politely told her a half-truth and a half-lie. I won't let you touch the animal because you're not a Muslim, he said. This was true, but it was also true that in Keita's experience, women were not permitted to butcher meat. I know you are skilled, he added, but this is not a matter of trust. It's a matter of ritual. I'm a Muslim, you see. A Muslim must eat meat, meat, a Muslim must eat only meat that is slaughtered by himself or by another Muslim. As Keita spoke, Cheryl studied him and scraped the toe of her boot in the dirt and hay, rubbing her chin and smiling. Finally, she shrugged. Suit yourself, she said. I don't mean to sound stupid, but I don't know, does the Quran actually have instructions for butchering meat? The fifth surah, Keita said. We call it a surah, the term for chapter. They're not instructions exactly, they're more like guidelines. In the third paragraph, Allah warns us, and he recited the deity's wishes, roughly, for the translation from Arabic on the spot was difficult for him. You must not eat those animals which die of themselves, nor the blood of swine's flesh, and all that has been killed in any other name than that of Allah, and you must not eat the animals choked or those animals killed by a blow or fall or a goring or those killed by other animals, 
and you must make the animal clean by putting it to death by your own hand. Kata looked at the ground awkwardly. He said, religion is not like science, I suppose. American women, their directness and independence, particularly with men, made Kata nervous. But Cheryl's knowledge and her easy ability with animals impressed him. At the college horse stable, he'd once watched her, he'd once watched her calm a horse that had become dangerously upset when somehow the hoof and ankle of a front leg became, became tangled in a strand of barbed wire carelessly left in the exercise corral. Cheryl entered the corral alone as the animal ran about frantically, at one point rearing on its hind legs to shake the wire off. She calmed the horse, talking to the animal until it stood still while she knelt on one knee and slowly removed the wire. Keta thought she must have special powers. I didn't mean to be rude, Cheryl said suddenly. You weren't, Keta said. We're both scientists. We're askers of questions. She entered the pen and quickly put a rope around the goat's neck. She led Keta and the goat into a barn to a corner where a large cement slab on the ground sloped into a drain. He carefully washed his hands at a large sink. She grabbed a pair of oversized blood-stained jeans overalls from a hook and handed them to Keta. You'd best wear these over your clothes, Cheryl said. Then she asked, you don't mind if I watch. Please, Keta said, not at all. He looked away for a moment, then he said, I don't want to be trouble for you, but I must do this outside on the dirt. It's important, you see, that I spill the blood on the soil, in the open air, in order to cleanse the earth. Cheryl thrust her hands deep in her jeans pockets. She said, yeah, sure, out back of the barn, there's plenty of room. They walked across the barn, Keta carrying to his smooth forehead. Even though he'd just shot a bear, there was innocence in him. But to me, his innocence didn't excuse him. My hands grew clammy. I wanted to call him a redneck who just murdered a bear for a trophy. But my mother was more subtle. Do you still live at home, she said. Yes, ma'am. I live in Hamilton. With your mom? Yes, ma'am. She walked around the bear, studying the body. That's a fine bear, she said. She touched her hand to its meaty shoulders. You know, the flies will blow that if you don't get it in the cooler. See those flies? The boy's eyes perked up. They'll lay their eggs in it, maggots. No, they won't, he said. I could tell he wanted to sound authoritative, but he didn't. His voice was shaky, almost scared. You put that bear in the ice chest right now, she said. Two oversized coolers were stationed nearby. The young man spread a blue tarp on the ground under the bear and loosened the pulley. The corpse fell like a leviathan. You need to put the hide in the cooler too, she said. Yes, ma'am, he said, and he went and got his knife. That's right, she said, guiding him through the process of cutting the bear into meat lovingly and tenderly while I stood by as a silent witness, cringing at the sound of knife on bone. He kept looking up at my mother, maybe for affirmation, maybe for atonement. And I saw that to him, she'd been nothing but an old lady, bossy, used up, worthless even, until she pulled out her hunting knowledge, the flies will blow it, and instructed him on how to care for the bear. Now he saw her as someone who was vital to his survival in the wilderness. And because he saw her differently, I saw her differently too. Thank you. <laughs> Tiffany Midge has an MFA from the University of Idaho. Uh, she does not keep bees, eat organic exclusively, or join protests, and does not consider herself very earth justice -y, except for her devotion to composting and recycling. Quote, maybe I came to Moscow 10 years ago and stayed because I don't have to drive everywhere like I would in a big city. 
Maybe it's because I've been charmed from living near the land of butterflies. Hello, thank you so much for coming and thank you to the organizers. This is, um, this is a very old, let me see that thing on. Um, this is a much older uh, nonfiction piece. Uh, it's called Beets, and it's about my family's foray into gardening. <laughs> In fourth grade history class, I learned that the Plains Indians weren't cut out to be farmers, that the government tried to get them to plant corn, but that it was just one of those no-win situations, meaning that no matter how hard the Indians fought against progress, manifest destiny, and the American dream, they'd never win. This history lesson occurred around the same time the U.S. media began its hyper-ecological awareness campaigns. All kinds of theories were developed, assertions that the Earth was headed towards another ice age, whereas today scientists tell us that the Earth is getting hotter. It was during this time that my father's convictions regarding the demise of the 20th century began tipping toward fanaticism. The whole Earth catalog took up residence in our home, and he began reciting from it as if it were scripture. He wanted us to all get back to nature. I think he would have sold the house and moved us all into the mountains to raise goats and chickens, but my mother, who regularly didn't have much to say in the family decisions, threatened to leave him for good if he took his plans to fruition. So he settled with gardening. Actually, gardening is too light a word for the blueprints he drew up, which would transform our medium-sized backyard into a small farming community. One day, I returned home from school and discovered my father shoveling manure from a pile tall as a two-story building. I couldn't help but wonder where he ever purchased such a magnificent pile of shit, and impressive though it was, I doubt my neighbors shared in his enthusiasm. The following weekend, our suburban nuclear unit had transformed into the spitting image of the Sunshine family dolls. I began calling my sister Dewdrop, myself Starshine. I renamed my mother Corn Woman and my father Reverend Buck. <laughs> Reverend, Bru Reverend Buck considered it considered it his personal mission in life to convert us from our heathen hungry man TV dinner bisquick and Pop-Tart existence. Do you realize that with all these extra preservatives, after you're dead and buried, your body will take several extra years to completely decompose, Father said. That wasn't exactly a concern ranking on the top of my list, being that I was only nine. But my sister Judy summed it up with, I don't care. I plan on being cremated. As the good reverend's wife and children, we must have represented some deprived tribe of soulless, bereft Indians, and he designated himself to take us, the godless parish, under his wing. It was a nice dream. His heart was in the right place. I'm sure the U.S. government back in the days of treaties, relocation, and designation of res reservation lands thought their intentions were noble too. I kind of admired my father for his big ideas, but sided with my mother on this one. Father was always more interested in the idea of something rather than the actuality. To him, bigger meant better. My father liked large things. Generous mass, quantity, weight, for him they represented progress, ambition, trust. Try as he might to be a true renegade, adopt Indian beliefs and philosophies, and even had gone so far as to marry an Indian woman, he could still never avoid the obvious truth. He was a white man. He liked to build large things. Father assigned each of us a row. Mother was busily stooped over issuing corn into the soil as if offering gems of sacrifice as if offering gems of sacrifice to the earth goddess. I was in charge of the radishes and turnips, which up until that day I'd only known through tales of Peter Rabbit stealing from Mr. McGregor's garden. I bent down over my chore, all the while on keen lookout for small white rabbits accessorized in garbadine trousers. My mother wanted to put in yellow beans 
a type of bean she'd never gardened before. She squinted and read the packing instructions, her glasses perched on the end of her nose. Only plant in full, direct sunlight. She looked up from the seed packet, surveyed the sky, the incoming clouds. It was nearing sunset, and soon it would be dusk. So my mother put away the packet of seeds <laughs> to plant for the next day. She Amelia bedelia it. My sister was diligently poking holes into the soil for her onions when our collie began nosing around the corn row, scouting for a place to pee. Get out of the corn, Charlie, I yelled. Father chuckled and said, hey, a scorned corn dog. Mother rolled her eyes, what a corny joke. Judy feigned fainting and said, you punish me. Yes, we were an image right out of the Norman Rockwell classic. The caption reading, Squaw Man and Family, an American Portrait of Hope. <laughs> Thank you so much. Linda Russo is relatively new to the Palouse, having moved here seven years ago. She'd never before spent time in such a vastly agricultured landscape or so close to the confluence of two tributaries of the Columbia River. you on a quick meander through my, I'm just going to hold it, through my um, recently published book of poems that um, I've written out of my experience of living in this landscape. And um, oh, I just want to thank people for coming to the Palouse, to come to Asley. I've been so inspired and I've, I've learned so much from um, hearing people. And I want to thank local people for coming too and for reading. Um, okay, so this book is called Meaning to Go to the Origin in Some Way. And the only thing you need to know is that there is a, uh, when you hear she said, that's my mother who wrote to me after I moved out here. I grew up in the Northeast. Um, she wrote to me to tell me about the Columbia Basin pygmy rabbit that was um, going extinct while I was writing the book that did go extinct. Going to survey Walmart construction from the crest of Pioneer Hill. It begins with walking, feet mucked by competing agendas, and a wish to speak as part and parcel, a rare cow parsnip community, part of a history of embattlement, of space being filled, a well-preserved remnant of Idaho fescue grasslands, where walking is merely civil, and walking is compromised, still the largest remnant of natural Palouse vegetation, citizenry. I wish to invoke freely a culture of interspecies inhabitants, valuable thickets of Douglas Hawthorne, conflicts resolved, powers balanced. Sometimes it takes less than a minute. Magpie Forest, Rose Creek, Smoot Hill. You hitch up your bird wings, hoping an essential radish on the Pacific Flyway. Simply an essential radish from radical having roots, meaning to go to the origin in some way. On the Pacific Flyway, the seed you planted sprouted, the least turns took wing, flashed silhouettes of shorebird running, pecking at Copple Farm in landlocked Pullman, June 2010 meaning to go to the origin in some way, acting animal-like towards boundaries, breathing. Participant as birds. Participant as birds unlashing from the clouds. Her small body there practiced on bird scales returns public space to public use till syllables unlink, till traffic's return brought back to the familiar, the creaturely, existence plus alphabets. 
You're twirling in song or chipping or calling. Are we speaking the same language? Your flat note of inattention. What brings us to this place? Your seesaw, your caw, your hum, scribble, your chirp, your wall of branches, your goddamn three dogs barking at it all. What writing is indigenous to a place? The birds punctuating the grass, perhaps. The squirrel punctuating the branch. She said, I think they make too much of dinosaurs. Shopping centers and cheap food production, the song of arable, of arable, of dams, of more natives squeezed out in the production of more arable land. Arable, likely to air we are. She said, I think you also care because you have walked in her paths, sagebrush, sage grouse, the grasses and forbs, sage sparrows and Washington ground squirrels, forbs, the flowers of grasslands, last little rabbit, her confusion and loneliness, her worn out angry eyes. Will you not think me silly for sounding the organic milk alarm? going to survey Walmart construction from the crest of Pioneer Hill. That's a hill in Pullman where I live. We and our many vectors crisscross this space, pinned to each other with our kind human greeting, our open, generous, uncomplicated, beg for release. Repetition, don't forget. Zigzag, little ant. Wave, wave, bunch of glass. Grass, clovers, wave, lawn grass, fence, and sky, wave, lawn grass, fence, and sky. A little rhyme here, and now a little song. I wish to invoke the analytic capacity of sentient poetry. Sit for a spell in my space and drink this tea with me. Recall current taxonomies. It's where you might go to reinvest in the blue of chicory or worm seed mustard or whitlow grass or needaker weed, patching together remnants, restoring wild handiwork culture. Thank you. Okay, I had to stand on tiptoe anyway, the way it was. Okay. <laughs> Robert Wrigley spends most of every summer catching and releasing native West Slope cutthroat trout, although he only rarely catches more or bigger fish than his wife, Kim Barnes, and he's okay with that. Don't mind me. <laughs> Ordinarily, you do this, and then the mic slowly sinks. And you have to call to the technical people for microphone Viagra, as they call it in the turn in the business. I'm going to read two poems, both having to do with this place, this place, and places much like it. The thing about the Palouse is that it's occasionally a tad breezy. I like the wind. We are at or near that approximate line where a stiff breeze becomes or lapses from a considerable wind, and I like it here. The chimney smokes right angled from west to east, but still, for those brief intact stretches, the plush animal tails of fires. 
I like how the stiffness rouses the birds right up until what's considerable sends them to shelter. I like how the afternoon's rain, having wakened the soil's raw materials, has sent a root smell into the air around us, which the pine trees sway stately within. I like how the sun strains not to go down, how the horizon tugs gently at it, and how the distant grain elevator's shadow ripples over the stubble of the field. I like the bird feeder's slant and the dribble of its seeds. I like the cat's sleepiness as the breeze, then the wind, then the breeze keeps combing her fur. I like the body of the mouse at her feet. I like the way the apple core I tossed away has browned so quickly. It is much to be, dis much to be admired, as is the way the doe extends her elegant neck in its direction and the workings of her black nostrils, too. I like the sound of the southbound truck blowing by, headed east. I like the fact that the dog is not barking. I like the arc of the house afloat on the sea of March and the swells of the crop hills bedizened with sedias of old snow. I like old snow. I like my lungs and their conversion to the gospel of spring. I like the wing of the magpie out held as, out held as he probes beneath it for fleas or lice. That's especially nice. The last sun pinkening his under feathers as it also pinks the dark when I close my eyes, which I like to do in the face of it. This stiff breeze that was, when I close them, a considerable wind. This one's sort of built the same way. Both of these poems might be said to be composed anaphorically, or another way to say that is repetitively, I guess. Uh, this is a poem called County. It could be this county, could be a number of counties in the West. County of innumerable nowheres, half its dogs underfed and of indeterminate breed. County of the deep friar and staples in glass against mice. County of horned gods and billed hats. Sweat county, shiver county. The hallowed outhouse upholstered in woolly carpet. The sack of lime, time out of time. County of country music. Insufficient snow plows county, county of the blasted doe all winter in a drift, dust sift and feather duster county, county of the quo all status is attached to, of batches and bitch dogs howling, of rowels and boots, of soot wash, of the chimney sweeps red beard, of the songless radio preaching to no one in the shed. County of the deadly road, of the shoat pig roasted in a pit. County of molasses, hobo coffee, and sugarless soft drink. County of the methamphetamine picture window, of the padlock and massive hasp. County of tools and dewormers, curry comb and salt block, black pepper gravy, red eye venison, blood sausage. County of Bud Light girl posters. Treble Hook County, Chum County, Bear Bait and Dead Wolf County, County of the Coyote Pelt Nailed to the Barn Door, Bruised Woman County, of Men Missing One or More Fingers, Single Finger Wave County, Pistol Alongside the Cash Register, Pitch Dense Firewood County, County of the Fearful and the Fearless of the Distant Mysterious School. Target Poor County, Walmart Holy Land, Malodorous Pulp Mill and Paper Plate County, County of the Hundred Yard Drive to the Post Office, Oddly Familiar Faces Among the Wanted Posters. <laughs> Four Hour Drive from the County Seat County, Unadopted Highway, County of No Return. County of August Always Somewhere Burning, 
beer can bejeweled barrel pit county, hardly one bullet unpunctuated county road sign county, county of the ATV and the ancient Indian trail into the high mountains, get your bull or buck county, on the way to somewhere else, do -si do hundred frozen casseroles after the funeral, go to heaven county, blister and blister rust county, Yahweh trailer house county, unassisted living, county of the gospels and the penthouse under the bed, county of tenderness and terror, of almost universal skepticism, Jesus country county, county of the cell tower stipend, everywhere and anywhere, Boneyard County, County a day's drive from the end of the open road, Softshell Baptist County, Pentecostal Pancake County, County of illusions and hard facts, Rock and broken shock, Rock and roll aught sick, Savior shell casing, County of not quite breathtaking vistas, Of the for sale sign, of Timothy and Brome, Spring and Autumn Slaughter County, Meat County, home. Thank you. I've lived here only since August 2013, more than long enough to be overwhelmed by the beauty of the Palouse, on an Alaska Airlines flight from Seattle to Pullman, I was so struck by that beauty as we moved across the Cascades, the Columbia Basin, and the Palouse that I had to take notes on my napkin and when I ran out of room, take notes on my cell phone because I didn't have any paper. So I'm delighted to hear from such a fine group of writers who found so many ways to put this extraordinary place into words. And thanks to everybody for coming out to hear them.